Okay, this is an interview with Rich Perez, NFL broadcaster, Major League Baseball broadcaster, sports in general broadcaster, and good thanks friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I was in Indiana running a footlocker, and one of the guys that I hired kind of reminded me of Deion Sanders, so I, I hired him. And he actually had a part-time job at a TV station. So as he worked with me at Foot Locker, closing the store, we always talk sports. And he goes, you know, Daryl Strawberry, Eric Davis, all these great guys. You should do a sports show. You really talk very passionately about all these people. And I said, hmm, I just, I guess I've never thought about it. I, I don't know anything about it, though. So the next day, I get a call. Hey, come over here. I'm having lunch out at this hot dog stand. This is Michigan City, Indiana. A very small place outside of Chicago. And um, so I go to the lunch, and he's sitting there with the head guy of the cable uh, access station. And the guy says to me, um, I heard you want to do a, radio, a sports show. And I, I didn't want to make him look bad, so I said, well, yeah, we, we talked about it a little bit. And he goes, oh, I love the voice. I think you're, you're going to be good at it. And, um, and I was just coming out of baseball, playing baseball. So, uh, and the Rams had moved to St. Louis, and I ended up in Indiana. So um, lo and behold, I did it. I did it for about a month. A month into it, I went in there, and I said, I'm watching my show on TV. I'm terrible. I can't do this anymore. And he goes, wait a minute. Let me show you the ratings that just came out. And he shows me. I had the top show in the Great Lakes area. So I was like, wow. Maybe I'm better than I Maybe I'm too hard on myself. And so I kept at it, kept at it. Sam Hill joined me, ex-Maverick. That turned into uh, me leaving Michigan City after doing their little parades and their floating cardboard boat race. And I took that and parlayed that to Denver. They gave me a primetime show on uh, Rocky Mountain Cable covering the Broncos, the uh, Nuggets, the Rockies. And really everything ex exploded after that. And I ended up back in Vegas and CBS picked me up. So just kind of evolved. Sure, sure. I, I don't know that I had that in mind when I left Franklin High School. Um, I just wanted to be a baseball player. And... Uh, it turned into something else. Right. Uh, right. But all that parlayed together really did. Excellent. Excellent. So what inspired you to pursue a career in radio broadcasting? And how has your journey uh, um, shaped your approach to connecting with your listeners? Um, I, think, I think because of the unique experiences, the connecting part. Um, we were talking off camera about Kenny Stabler. A story like that, people, it just doesn't generally happen. I have this unique ability to sit here and tell you, I'm going to meet Taylor Swift one day. And I will meet Taylor Swift in two weeks. Just something weird like that. Now, I have not met her. But uh, <laughs> I did that same thing with Jennifer Love Hewitt. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet Jennifer Love Hewitt. I was watching her on TV. And I met Jennifer Love Hewitt in two weeks. And, and now we're friends. It's just the weirdest thing. So I think, I think that connection, all these stories that you can tell. Vince Scully was a great storyteller. Yes. Really my mentor, Chick Hearn. My dad worked together, so I got to know Chick Hearn very well. So I got to know Vince Scully very well. So I, I became kind of a reflection of those guys. And um, so when I was pursuing radio, I... Uh, I really was pursuing TV, more along the lines of TV. And um, lo and behold, I ended up in radio and did very well at it. And now I just do these little Facebook clips and people like them. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I just pull out the camera wherever I can. And sometimes people are looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? You know? <laughs> but I don't know. that. I think radio, I just fell into it accidentally. Not something I was really pursuing and ended up in the Hall of Fame for radio. So it's just weird. Weird how everything nice, came nice. together. Can you uh, share with us a memorable on-air moment 
or an interview that you had a significant imp- that had a significant impact on you personally, and and what did you learn from that experience? Well, I had um, probably my my best interview was with uh, Dan Issel, and uh, Dan Issel was the coach of the Nuggets and a great Nugget player, yes. Hall of Famer. Yes, I had him on the show, and I didn't know Dan from. You know, I just knew he was a player. And uh, because of Dan Issel, he opened the door for me to that from that interview to uh, the Broncos, to the Rockies, to the just covering all these teams because I said I knew Dan Issel and he gave me names of people to contact. And so I think from a professional standpoint, I, I always thank Dan Issel because uh, he made the world a difference for me. Um, to break through sure. because there's so many guys that are coming out of college and so forth and trying to make it and they're waiting for the big call. And I, I haven't had that. I, I just kept doing something on my own. I didn't wait for anybody. And, uh, and I think that's what worked for me. Uh, I just, I never waited for NBC to call me or, the NFL Network, and I've ended up on the NFL Network uh, doing a lot of their uh, guest appearances, talking about football. And I guess that's what it is. Dan Essel would be the turnaround for me. Okay, great. How do you stay connected with your audience and adapt their changing interests and preferences in the dynamic world of radio? Um, you have to stay on top of things. So many players change. Uh, you know, I could be talking one minute to to – Charles Woodson about players in his era. And if I go too far back, talk about Rick Upchurch, he's like, Rick Upchurch, who's Rick Upchurch, you know? Uh, but uh, you, you kind of have to stay in this era thing. Sure. So right now we've got Aaron Rodgers, who's the old man of the league, right? And hurt. But um, then we got a new guy like Aiden O'Connell, who the Raiders have. So there's a big difference there. And you have to play within those gaps. So I always look at who the oldest player is and who the youngest is and who's in between that. So I stay kind of fresh because I can easily fall into the 70s and people are like, what is he talking about? Norm Sneed, Roman Gabriel, where are these guys? You know, So, so I, I think that's the big thing. You have to stay up to, to date with what's going on. Sure, certainly. So how do you prepare for your shows and ensure they remain fresh, engaging for your audience week after week. Uh, I, you know, I, I, and, and you're constantly thinking, you know, so I'm always one step ahead. My wife says, oh, you're always thinking a step ahead, a step ahead, a step ahead. And I think, I think that's the big thing. I, I could be walking into the parking lot and just something hits me on Allegiant Stadium. I better tape something right here. Or uh, look at these fans. I'm going to tape something right here. And I'll just pull the camera on and do it. And so people, like I said, people will look at me strange or they'll say, I've seen you before, but I don't know where. And I'm just, oh, I'm just a fan. Yeah. I, I don't really elaborate unless they know who I am. Then it's different. But I just try to find something good in, in everything. And even walking through the gates would be a great show. you know. But the things that I, we go through every day, buying gas, you don't realize there's, there's a story behind everything. So I'm constantly thinking and I'm constantly looking and I'm constantly looking around me. And I think that's why I've been such a celebrity magnet. I'll be getting gas and there's, you know, whoever standing there. And, and then I'm like, oh, let's go talk to him. And so I, I think that's what it is. I'm just, I'm just alert. And I, and I try to bring something fresh and different. Sometimes you see me as a baseball player and sometimes you see me as a Raider and sometimes you see me as a Dodger and sometimes you, you see me, I'm just Rich Perez with all these grandkids. You know? right. So, right. <laughs> so I, think, I think that's what I enjoy bringing is that I'm just a normal guy who I caught some great breaks. And, sure. and I, I, I enjoy doing what I do. Great, great. The next question is not on my list. It's just something that's been heavy with me. Mm-hmm. And every year I see on Facebook Major League Baseball, the, I'm going to start crying, no, it's all right. Major League Baseball. They do a... My goodness. No, that's all right. They do a great tribute to your son. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
No, and I, can you, thank you. Can you elaborate a little on that? Yeah. Um, I did kind of an East Coast tour a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, Yankees called me. Of course, I played with the Yankees and the minors. And uh, uh, they said, hey, we want to do a, uh, a pl- um, veteran of the game for your son. Uh, my son passed away in 2005 in Iraq, uh, Marine Corps. And so that was big news here in town. And... Um, you know, uh, it took me a long time to be able to talk about it. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. But we went to Yankee Stadium. It was a great tribute. It's, it's on Facebook. I've had it up there, and uh, they talked about him before the bottom half of the inning. Got a great ovation, standing ovation, which was great. Mm-hmm. It's not for me, and I think people. We have the same name. He's Rich Perez Jr. And so uh, we have a street in Henderson. Uh, behind Coronado High School, which is his street. And um, I used to drop him off on that street. So a lot of tributes around the city. And Major League Baseball has been great with us. Um, So the Yankees did that. I'm sitting in the ninth inning. My phone rings. It's the Red Sox. Hey, when's your son's birthday? I said, it's actually in two days. Can you guys come up here? We want to do something for your son. So they make him the player of their game. Oh, wow. And not only that, then they have my wife paint home plate before the game. I mean, just before the game. And I throw the first pitch at Fenway. And uh, really a a tremendous, I can't tell you how, how good both those teams are to us, the Yankees and the Red Sox. Now, I played for one. I didn't play for the other, but I, I, I have such a respect for the Red Sox. And um, I just think that um, uh, it's been a, it's been, I, I can't, I can't express what it is. It's, I'm a gold star father. So I'm only one of what, 5,000 in the country. And um, uh, it's a tough thing to go through, um, probably emotionally. Sure. Because there was a couple of years I didn't do anything. And then, um, one day I just woke up and I felt like, you know, it was time to go forward. And I did. And, and so now I've, I've got all these tributes that, that come up. The 51s have done something when they were the 51s, the aviators. Uh, Don Logan and his good people here. Um, then at Red Rock, we have a memorial. And, uh, so it's a lot of uh, military. I was not in the military, but uh, um, I have a great respect for all people in the military. And... Uh, Look, I I don't by any means as a parent like what happened. Um, I miss Rich every day. Okay. Every day. There's not a day that goes by I don't think about it. I walk into Raiders Day, I'm thinking about Rich. Uh, driving to the stadium, I'm thinking, or driving to wherever I'm going, or flying on an airplane. Or, uh, so he was all part of this, and really my motivation to do what I was doing was based upon I'm going to build something mm-hmm. at CBS, and I'm going to pass it to Rich because he had the same voice. We sounded exactly the same and uh, a little bit taller than me, but that's not hard to do. So, uh, I, but really a great kid. And um, so I was trying to build up even, you know, baseball cards and stuff like that. You collect as a kid, you're ready to give it to your son. Well, I have three girls after him. And um, so I, it's probably the adjustment of, of losing him and then my father shortly after that. Uh, the bookends um, has been tough. My dad was a boxing champ in 55, and um, so I was very close to both of them. And, um, but I still feel like I almost quit everything. And, uh, I, but I, I, I wake up every day and I go, you know, I'm still here and I still have a lot to give. And I'm, uh, I don't, I have a lot of people that like me, I think, and, and I, I'm lucky for that. And I think the motivation is still there and I think they can see me out there still doing it. Sure, you know? sure. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's hard, it's hard. And it's a, it's a tough situation. And, um, you know, from, from psychic people talking to me about it and I kind of feel like the, you know, the spiritual world is alive and well, um, so I've, I don't know, I've had a lot of really good people <clears throat> from, you know, Cher even, 
reaching out to me and uh just people that you would never expect um you know hence why i'm good friends with jennifer love hewitt as well so um it's just been a, a a different experience and i've met a lot of people who have great abilities and uh i i think it's probably the worst thing you can go through really sure, sure. to lose a, a child especially in a war that i have to tell you and i i'm i'm frank about it uh 2001 when the twin towers were hit he was in 11th grade and for some reason i was watching that happen that travesty we all saw the twin towers and i thought to myself this is going to affect me somehow and it did and he was only in 11th grade but a year and a half later he was in iraq and uh so i i i'm proud of what he did uh and i'm I, really people ask me about his military career really is this much of it because you know he had little league he had he grew up as a kid i you know we raised him and so um that's what i remember sure but a lot of people bring up the military oh he was a marine i'm proud of that but i don't know that world i really don't you know i, I we were a year and a half that was it half of that time was in boot camp and half of that time was in training and before you know it, it was just a weird accident that occurred so um got the news in hawaii uh, i was at the pro bowl and uh golfing i was on the course with joy browner and marcus allen and here comes a marine and i see him and i'm thinking he's not walking to me he's not because i just talked to rich telling he was telling me he was coming home in a week he had already mailed his stuff he said okay so the guy walks up he goes hey you got to come with me well what happened and uh i said uh he said I can't tell you, only the major can tell you. So they take us to the Hilton Hawaiian Village, and we're sitting there in a room. They found my wife at Pearl Harbor. They bring her over. So they goes to show, they, if they want to find you, they're going to find you. They found me, and uh, they found her, and they got us at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. And the major came in, and just the way he took his hat off, and I knew, I knew something was wrong. And, um, you know, and he told me what happened. And, um, yeah, it's a tough moment, though. It really is. And uh, the, really, it affected that Pro Bowl game of 2005. Probably the worst Pro Bowl because Donovan McNabb was in there. And all those guys were staying at that hotel. And they were all in the hallway. What happened? What happened? What happened? You know, And um, really, one of the worst experiences to go through. But, um, but again, I don't want to tarnish his, his uh, legacy. You know, it's a, it's a good one here in Vegas, and he's a great kid, and uh, everybody would have loved him had they met him. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I look forward to seeing that story and the, the tributes that MLB does for you, and I just, yeah. it just yeah, it's really speaks nice. to me. It's, an, it's really nice, and they're really good about the military. And, yes. Uh, again, another experience. So I, I mean, who thinks you're going to go through something like that? You know, I, I, I wasn't even thinking military in my whole life. Nobody in my family is military. And uh, I don't know. It's just a weird experience. I, I hate that it happened. I really do. Um, but um, I have to keep going. And, I, and I, I, like I told you, I woke up about two and a half years later, and I said, okay, I'm either going to die or keep going. And I said, I got to keep going. So, um, you know, you, you just come to the you – just, you're just tired. You're just beat up over it. Sure. You know, it could be a parent. It could be a, uh, you know, unfortunate for me, it was my son. And then, uh, and then right after it was my dad. So, um, so I got kind of a double whammy at that time. And, uh, um, but I, again, I wouldn't be sitting here without my father and I love talking about my son. So sure. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah, absolutely. That. No, well, let's, we'll go back to why we're here for artsy and no, no, that's good. So in speaking of artsy in the age of digital media and streaming platforms, what do you believe sets radio apart and makes it a unique and valuable form of entertainment and information dissemination? Look, the, the arts are great really. Uh, and, and what you guys are doing here is tremendous. I think it's, it's great to put a, a focus and a spotlight on people that do things, uh, because there's such an art form in everything. And, uh, you know, being it 
pulling out your phone and taking a selfie or uh, which I don't do at all <laughs> and, uh, or or uh, just talking to somebody and you know I saw a guy on on Facebook who he had the paint dripping maybe you saw it and and he's got his thing moving and the things moving and the, it's turned into like a spiral graph type of thing of painting and he's making a living doing that on these big sheets of paper and I was like wow it's pretty amazing that somebody can do that but who would see that you know what I mean you might see it at the store and go okay there's a picture and I think we take for granted sometimes a great picture or a great piece of art or a great you know like I'll go to Michael's and I Michael's or or any of these stores that sell you know pictures and I started looking my wife was like what are you looking at I said there's just a great picture in every piece of art and so uh I'm a lot of art I'm my wife is not but I'm I'm more into the the art side of things and I enjoy people's talents and uh I think I think we we can all learn from each other uh in that manner and so I I love I love pictures of a beach she likes pictures of a mountain I'm not so much of a mountain but I'm more of a beach so I I think we all have to find what we like and so what what you're doing here is I think is tremendous um I mean look at the artwork on the rug for example you know what I mean it's just it's crazy you know the setup the I guess what do they say life is art right and it really is you know so I I think this is all great nice well Part of our, being part of Artsy, we're fortunate and very lucky to have you here with us today. Oh, thank appreciate you. I appreciate you, you having me. So moving on. Uh, so how do you approach curating content for your radio show to highlight and promote artists in the local arts community? You know, I've, I've, I'm probably responsible for it. And, I, and again, I'm not patting myself on the back. But probably half the guys on the radio or on TV in Las Vegas, I've started them. Uh, Ken Thompson, for example, who's been on for years. He started with me uh, in a garage. We were in a garage in Henderson doing podcasts. And um, he, he got better and better and better and wanted to do his own thing. And so they do that. Aaron Phillips is another one. Uh, all these guys started with me. And, you know, I get it. They want to grow. You know, you don't want to be with Rich all the time. But uh, they want to do their own thing. And so uh, now I'm doing some stuff with John Castelloni, uh, who's with Fox. And, uh, you know, so I'm starting to collaborate with a lot of people. Jesus uh, Verduzco Lopez uh, from the uh, Golden Knights, the Spanish announcer. He sits by me in the press box, and we talk all the time. And we want to do a lot of stuff. So there, I think collaborating now, I don't mind helping a younger kid. There's a kid named Ben Garcia who I launched. He's the last one. He's in Phoenix and he's on Facebook doing his thing now. And so, uh, I think there's, I mean, I can give you 20 more names. I think the biggest thing is for, I want to see people succeed. I do more than I did, you know, that that's great. Uh, and I, I'm happy for them to see them move on and to do some things sure. and so forth. And it, it's been, a, a Jay Schrader is my partner and you know, he was the quarterback when we grew up in L.A. Right, and right. Um, now he's trying to get into radio and so forth. And, um, you know, he's also he also runs a, a Christian academy here in school in um, Vegas. Maybe you can get him on as a guest. I was just going <laughs> to kind of segue there. Maybe we can get a connection and oh. bring him into the studio and yeah, for sure. do an interview with him. But another great guy. So, um, you know, I. There's a guy who's had all the success in the world in sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been a baseball player. He's been a football player. He, he he laughs at me all the time because he tells me that he's the only guy who ever caught a ball from Pete Rose and threw a ball to Bo Jackson. So I said, I guess you are the only one who's done that. Nobody else, who else can say they did that, right? right. So, yeah, it's been it's been fun. So I like promoting guys. If somebody's interested, you know, and they want to get in my world a little bit, I can let them in a little bit. I can't really do too much with, with the Raiders uh, because it's kind of tough for me to even get in there. Sometimes I can't get in their game. So, um, but if it's outside of work and, you know, they want to do something with me, I'll, I'll be glad to do it. It's no problem. Nice. Can you discuss a particularly memorable interview or segment with an artist 
that left a lasting impression on you and your audience? And what was it about that interaction that made it stand out? Wow. Uh, maybe, I know this is going to sound weird. <laughs> Probably Joe Jackson, Michael's dad. Uh, I knew him very well. Um, I worked at a company called CMX here in town. Um, so CMX was involved with all A-list celebrities. I'm talking about Vivica Fox, Mike Tyson, just anybody you can think of, Vander, Don King, of course. And that's how I got into boxing. So I would say that, that Joe, this is the epitome of a guy who raised his kids to be superstars and it worked and I got to know him so well and I realized his his uh, drive was really based upon him wanting to be famous and that's what I think happened with Joe I think that he uh, was able to I just learned a lot eating lunch with the guy very serious friendly to me not so friendly to everybody else but I, I think, you know, even having him on the air was good. Um, but uh, I think a, a guy like that was strong for me because I realized you're sitting with a guy that just raised probably the biggest family that ever made money musically. And um, how did that happen? Well, he was a unique personality. And I think we saw the results of what happened with his kids and so forth. And um, it was good and it was bad. There was a, a, dull, a dual side to that, and he talked to me about both, both sides of that, the guys, the girls, from Janet to, to Jermaine to all of them. And so uh, I learned a lot from, from Joe, you know, just watching how he was. And, and then Kobe's dad as well, Jellybean. I was very close with him, and uh, I still am today. But uh, another situation of raising their kid who became the greatest, one of the greatest basketball players ever. Yes. You know, and, then, and then the tragedy of it all. But... Uh, uh, really um, learned a lot from from Joe as well. Jelly Be two Joes, Joe Jackson, Jelly Bean Joe, Bryant. So right. uh, two two really good guys who who had an impact really on me, a strong impact. Very nice. With the arts being such a diverse field, how do you balance showcasing established, well known artists with prov uh, with providing a platform for emerging or lesser known talents? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question because, uh, I deal with a lot of, uh, today, a lot of established guys, uh, on the Raiders or, or on one of the teams that come into town. But, um, I also enjoy talking to the new guy. So that new guy happened to be Jimmy Garoppolo when he was with the Patriots. And so they were in the Super Bowl and I was covering the Super Bowl against, um, Carolina. Uh, he was by himself. Nobody was talking to him. Super Bowl, they come out on a table. Everybody has a table. Nobody's talking to Jimmy Garoppolo. Huh. So I go, I'm going to go talk to Jimmy Garoppolo. So I got to know him. And lo and behold, see how things turn around. Now he's the star quarterback. And here we are. And he remembers, <laughs> oh, hey, yeah. So he's good with me. But um, you always have to remember, you're going to have the superstar in Peyton Manning, who's right here but there's another guy who's coming up. And that's what I think I learned in this business is that you have to pay, treat everybody equally because you just don't know. And uh, uh, my board op, my board op at a house when I first came to Vegas was a kid. He kept saying, Rich, I'm going to be famous one day. I'm going to be famous one day. He's by far the most famous guy today that, that has worked with me. And um, he was 15 years old. And um, I had him on. I would talk to him running the board. And uh, he said, you got to let me sing. I can sing. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So he's 15 singing on my show. And uh, he goes, uh, yeah, so my name is Neo. Okay. And um, I was like, okay, maybe you should change your name. That's what I told him. I said, I don't know if your name's going to stick. He goes, no, that's my name. And I said, okay, all right, stick to Neo. I don't know. What do I know, right? Anyhow, time went on. Then he tells me, hey, 
I sent my track in and I got, I'm going to be on the Rocky soundtrack. Wow. Okay. Wow. This is phenomenal, right? It's good news. I'm, I'm happy for him. So I'm still not buying, though. I'm not buying. I'm not buying. And then I end up, I go to Colorado for three years. And then coming to Colorado, uh, Neo, and I'm like, this could not be the same guy. This could not be the same guy. <laughs> and I look him up, and it's the same guy. And I said, this guy did it. So that's why I say you, don't, you just don't know uh, yes. when you're sitting in front of somebody sure. who's going to blow up like that. And, uh, you know, and now he's, he's still friends with me, but it's just, I, I keep telling him, where's my cut? You right. Know, where's my cut? I gave you your first break. So, uh, but I, I love to see that though. I really do. Uh, I love to see people just who I meet, you know, maybe this thing turns into a big monster one day and I was on the first show. <laughs> you know, so. Well, it's going to blow up and you're yeah. going to be one of the big headliners for, <laughs> for artsy. So, well, I appreciate that. You'll see your picture over there on that big banner on uh across from the wind <laughs> well it, it's it's funny because like i i don't like i don't chase fame and and um gloria estefan who i know very well she told me she said you for as little fame as you think you have it's probably much bigger and it doesn't last so enjoy while you have it and i said good point you know so uh yeah i i, I like it i I, I could have you here all night telling you stories of people, but it's just, it's crazy really what I've been through. It really is. Because I, I'm just really a normal guy that caught some breaks and I think I've, I've become very good at what I do. And, um, you know, it's just been crazy. Well, I've seen you on <laughs> HBO doing, you're doing next to Larry Merchant doing broadcasting with yeah. boxing matches. I've, yeah. I've seen that. You so. have done over 600 boxing matches. Um, I've been up for the Boxing Hall of Fame a couple of times, mm. and uh, I don't know that I deserve that. But uh, I, I don't know that I deserve anything. I just, you know, if something comes, it comes. And I think the older I've gotten now, um, I mean, I hate to say this, I'll be 60 years old in February, and I'm just like, okay, where have the years gone by? You know? and I'm, uh, but it's, it's been fun. I wouldn't have changed it for anything. For something that I just took on at age 30, and I said, I'll try it for a couple of years. It's still going. And uh, it's been great. I've met everybody I could possibly meet. Uh, but I, lo- I enjoy meeting everybody. Sure, sure. So it's been fun. So we have one final and fun question that we like to ask our yeah. guests. And if you were to walk into a party, what song would you want to hear? Ooh, you got me. On. This is good. You know, because different times of our lives, uh, people don't know you and I went to the same high school, but at that time would be a different song. And then maybe in my 30s it would be a different song. And then 40, so my wife has me as this country thing right now, you know. Uh, she took me to see Luke Bryan, who I, I, okay, I've heard these guys. I can't really say I know all their names. But I had probably the best time at his concert right here at Resort World. And I thought to myself, this guy's phenomenal. You know, so I didn't realize he had that many hits. ton of them. Now I'm singing all these songs, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, God, I'm big in the 80s. I am. I'm a big 80s guy. But I, but I, you know, I like, like I told you, I like this new stuff as well. Um, I, again, I don't, I don't want... I hate to fall into a category because I like 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, sometimes I want to hear the, the 60s because uh, it reminds me of when I was very little, you know, in, in Hollywood and growing up. And uh, you hear, you know, something from Carol King and it takes me back to Sunset Boulevard and Hyperion where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I grew up before I moved to Highland Park. But uh, I don't know. God, what would I want to hear? Cause sometimes I'm a hard rock guy too, and little ACDC isn't bad. So I don't know. Uh, uh, this is a good tough question. I don't know. I'm a big Hall and Oates guy too, you know. So uh, so maybe you'll just have a shuffle playing. Yeah, I I'm pretty easy going with the '80s, even the new stuff. I've heard Taylor's so great great artist. Um, 
you know, because I got three daughters that remind me that they have the greatest. Oh, artists. there's your song, then Taylor Swift <laughs> yeah. for your daughters. Yeah. So, um, and a great gymnast. I don't know if you knew I had a great gymnast in my family. I Arisa, did not know yeah. that. Yeah, she was a top 10 gymnast at Oregon State and Arizona State. Go Beavs. Yeah, so she's been a, that's why I knew Corvallis so well. Uh, but uh, I don't know. They, the girls, they remind me. And if I play something from Frank Sinatra, it reminds me of my dad. And they'll say, turn that off. Taylor Swift, put Taylor Swift. Okay, okay, let's put Taylor Swift. So I don't know. I'm pretty flexible, really, from sure. the 50s to today, really. Uh, you know, I'm still looking for my cut from... Uh, <laughs> my main man there. So. 